You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Get cash for clothes at Plato's Closet in North Charleston and West Ashley. It's so easy. Recycle, earn cash, repeat. We pay cash on the spot for your trendy, gently used clothing, shoes, and accessories. At Plato's Closet, we buy all seasons, all day, every day. It's time to clean out your closet and cash in. Bring in your denim, graphic tees, athletic wear, shoes, handbags, and more. Sell your styles to Plato's Closet for cash. Then do it again. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. Hello everyone and welcome to History of the Second World War, Episode 155, The Early Naval War Part 5, Danger Above and Below. This week a big thank you goes out to Blade for the donation and to John, Jeremy, and Abir for becoming members. You can find out more about becoming a member over at historyofthesecondworldwar.com slash members. This episode is going to focus on two topics that I don't think get enough focus when it comes to the early war at sea during the Second World War, mine warfare, and the early German air attacks against the Royal Navy. In the case of both of these topics, I think they get generally overlooked in favor of flashier topics like the actions of German surface raiders and German U-boats. But don't worry, both of those topics will be covered in good detail over the next seven episodes. But for now, this episode is going to be a time to shine for mines in the early naval air war. The actions, responses, and responses to those responses around both mines and the Luftwaffe would shape the course of the naval war in important ways, especially during the early period of the war when the Royal Navy was finding its footing and the German U-boat production capacity was still ramping up. Over the course of the war, tens of thousands of mines would be laid in the North Sea by both sides as they sought to control the naval traffic of the other. In the early months of the war, most of these were pre-planned from before the war and merely had to be executed on, and as soon as the war was declared, then that execution would begin. For the British, this meant both defensive and offensive mine belts. The defensive belts focused first on the English Channel, with two main belts of mines laid on either entrance to the channel to control German access, especially U-boat access. In both cases, over 3,000 mines were used. Generally, these mines were a mixture of magnetically activated mines, which would explode when a ship went over them due to how the ship affected the magnetic field of the mine, and then contact mines, which had to make contact with an enemy ship to explode. The magnetic mines were very good early in the war, but every nation would take efforts to demagnetize their ships before and during the conflict. This process is called degaussing and is still in use by modern warships to reduce their magnetic presence, to prevent magnetic mines or other magnetic munitions from being as effective. The original process of degaussing required electromagnetic coils to be installed around the ship, and by running a current through those coils, the magnetic effects of the ship could be eliminated. The problem was that these coils were expensive, and so they could not be installed on every ship that needed them, and so a cheaper method called deperming was invented, during which large electrical cables were moved over the outside of the ship to alter its magnetic signature. This worked well, with the downside being that this process had to be periodically repeated due to the effects of Earth's magnetic field serving to undo the deperming over time. But this was felt to be a, a very reasonable trade-off, and schedules were developed for ships to ensure that they could be depermed or wiped at the correct intervals. Offensive mine-laying efforts by the British focused on controlling German actions closer to the German coast, with mines laid on the routes that the Kriegsmarine was expected to travel when exiting the ports of northern Germany and making their way into the North Sea. On the side of the Germans, offensive mine-laying efforts were seen as a critical component of the war on British trade, and a major reason for this was the volume of British trade that transited the easily mineable coastal areas around the British Isles. The British understood the vulnerability of this trade and these ships that were moving around the coastline, but there was really nothing that they could do about it, because the structure of the transportation systems in Britain that crisscrossed the island were designed and built around the assumption that in many cases, the easiest way for something to transit between point A and point B was actually to get on a coastal merchant ship for at least part of the journey. 
the Germans were able to take advantage of this by using minefields around the British Isles to sort of impact all of this coastal trade. And to do this, they would lay minefields using three delivery methods, U-boats, aircraft, and destroyers. All three of these delivery methods would be used early in the war, but maybe the most interesting were the destroyers. Destroyers were kind of ideal mine delivery systems because of the number of mines that they could carry, with a German destroyer able to carry and disperse about 60 mines in one trip. But they had to properly time their actions to ensure that the times that they were most vulnerable to enemy action when they were laying mines close to the enemy coast was occurring at night. This became much easier to accomplish when the nights grew longer during the late autumn and winter months. Around the middle of October, the hours of darkness finally extended long enough that the first German destroyer mine laying operation to lay mines off of the Humber River estuary would be launched. To accomplish this, six German destroyers timed it, so they exited the defensive German minefields and moved into the North Sea just after nightfall, and then made a high-speed dash to the British coast. Then, when the mines were in position, they quickly made their way back to German ports, where they would be met by German cruisers to kind of provide them escort back over the last pieces of their journey. There were a few instances where the German cruisers actually also accompanied the destroyers on their entire journey, although that practice would end after the Nuremberg and Leipzig were torpedoed during one mine-laying mission by a British submarine. About a month after the first mine-laying mission, another mission would be launched, and the results would be very immediate. This was due to the fact that the German mine-laying run was planned to take place on the night of November 12th, and then, you know, into the morning of the 13th. But there was also a British mine-laying operation scheduled for the night before, which would have been the 11th and into the 12th. But the three British ships, two destroyers and a cruiser, were delayed on this mission due to fog. This meant that they did not get started until the evening of the 12th, just hours after the Germans had entered the North Sea. But the British ships were again delayed due to heavy fog. The German ships would then be lucky enough to lay their mines and escape, just hours before the British cruiser Adventure then went through that minefield and hit one of those mines. Although Adventure would make it to port and it would get repairs, those repairs would take until August 1940. The accomplishments of that one single mine-laying operation didn't end there, though, because it would be attributed with the destruction of 35,000 tons of British shipping over the coming days and weeks. Now, between October and February, 11 German destroyer mine-laying operations would be completed, with around 2,000 total mines laid during that time. These minefields, even with the British making concerted efforts to clear them over time, would cause the loss of 55 merchant ships three destroyers, and six smaller vessels. And these minefields were not the only ones that would be created by Germany. There would be instances of merchant ships being used to lay mines in a couple of instances, although that would generally involve a disguise so that they appeared to be a neutral ship from a neutral country hauling non-military cargo. But the most frequent delivery methods were U-boats and aircraft. But in both cases, they were a bit more limited in the size of the mines that could be deployed with some of the larger types of German mines simply being too large to be transported via U-boat or aircraft. Around a quarter of all effective mine attacks during 1939 were attributed to U-boat-laid mines, though. They were an important part of the mine-laying operations. There was, however, some resistance from some in the Kriegsmarine to use U-boats for this purpose because they felt they were better used on more offensive patrols in the Atlantic and the Western approaches. With Britain and Germany laying mines, thousands and thousands of mines, they both knew that they would have to put a lot of effort into sweeping the mines almost constantly to minimize the impacts of new minefields on their shipping. Most nations used very similar methods for minesweeping at this time, and so we'll kind of talk about the British system here, and, but it would not be out of place in any other navy. In the British system, there would be two large cables that would go out on either side of the ship. The ends of those cables were attached to floats that would keep the wire at roughly the correct depth to allow it to achieve its primary purpose, cutting the cables that held the mines in place. There were also some instances where the more active sort of cutting of cables was required, and this capability was introduced early in the war and would be an improvement to the method. 
Once the cables were cut on the mines, the mines generally floated to the surface, where they could be dealt with by simply shooting them with rifles, generally with armor-piercing ammunition. It was overall a simple process, but one that was quite dangerous, while at the same time being very monotonous. To try and minimize the danger to the ships involved, minesweepers generally worked at least in a pair, and often in larger groups. During the first sweep of an area, the ships would use what was known as the G formation, where the first ship would put out its sweeps, and then the ship behind would be behind but but in echelon, so the sweeps of the ship ahead of it allowed the second ship to sail in what was theoretically mine-free lanes, and then they would have their sweeps which would extend the line a little further. This also meant that the lead ship was in the greatest danger, but that for the most part was unavoidable. If it was felt that the area was at low risk of mines being present, a different formation could be used. In this formation, instead of sailing in echelon, the ships would maximize their sweep so that there was no overlap. You know, they would kind of just be beside each other. This was more dangerous, as all ships were unprotected. But when the risk was low, a larger area could be covered, and so this was seen as a worthwhile trade-off. The wider formation was often used for double-checking channels that had just been swept, So maybe the minesweepers would go down a channel in in G formation and then come back in the wider formation to check it again. But there were always limits to how much area the minesweepers could cover. And it was well understood that the task of sweeping all German mines everywhere was simply too much for almost any size fleet to really deal with. And so instead, the British would develop swept channels around the coast, which were constantly patrolled by minesweepers to try and minimize the damage caused by mines. Generally, this meant that minesweepers would sweep those channels every single day before any traffic was allowed to go through. Now, the downside of the swept channel system is that it also gave the Germans really good information about where exactly they should put their mines, but this was felt to be kind of an unavoidable problem. The goal was always to to just make sure that the areas that were known to be safe were kept safe, even if the Germans tried to mine them again. Overdraft fees are just the worst. Get up to $200 in fee-free overdraft with a Chime checking account. Sign up today at chime.com slash goals24. Banking services and debit card provided by the Bancorp Bank N.A. or Stride Bank N.A. members FDIC. Spot me eligibility requirements and overdraft limits apply. Get cash for clothes at Plato's Closet in North Charleston in West Ashley. It's so easy. Recycle, earn cash, repeat. We pay cash on the spot for your trendy, gently used clothing, shoes, and accessories. At Plato's Closet, we buy all seasons, all day, every day. It's time to clean out your closet and cash in. Bring in your denim, graphic tees, athletic wear, shoes, handbags, and more. Sell your styles to Plato's Closet for cash. Then do it again. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. Due to the confined nature of the North Sea, both the Luftwaffe and the Royal Air Force understood that aircraft could play an important role in the naval war. Even from the very start of the conflict, this impact would be felt. At the simplest level, aircraft were really good for scouting and reconnaissance, and the British hoped to use this to their advantage in one of their key missions, preventing German ships from reaching Germany. The primary group used to accomplish this would be the aircraft under coastal command, which would spend around 9,000 hours over the North Sea in just the first few months of the war. Weather was certainly a major problem, though, during these patrols, but there was also the possibility of running into German reconnaissance flights. This was a situation that happened a few times, to the point where there were actually flights of long-range reconnaissance aircraft that were actually armed, just in case they ran into German aircraft. If a German ship was spotted, the aircraft of Coastal Command would not actually attack them, as they did not carry any anti-ship weapons or they didn't have any anti-ship training. This meant that when a ship was to be attacked, the information was transmitted to Bomber Command, which would then dispatch bombing aircraft to attack the German vessels. This ran into the problem of the pilots of Bomber Command having little actual experience navigating over open water, which was a major problem during the early war years. These challenges from the RAF would simply take time. 
to resolve. And in some ways, the British were actually pretty fortunate that the Luftwaffe would be experiencing similar problems. The plans for the Luftwaffe in the North Sea were not really that much different than what the British were planning. The aircraft to be used would be controlled by the Luftwaffe, and they would be split into two groups. The first group would be made up of reconnaissance aircraft, most of which were either float planes or flying boats. These aircraft, around 154 of them, would stage reconnaissance flights with the goal of finding and tracking British naval movements. If a target was identified, the second group of aircraft would be brought in, which were generally just bombing squadrons from the Luftwaffe, with perhaps some extra training for naval attacks. The primary bombers used for this work were the HE-111s and the JU-88s. One aircraft that was not used very often was the Ju-87 Stuka, even though other nations, and the Germans themselves, realized that dive bombing was a very effective way to attack enemy ships while they were at sea. The problem for the Stuka is that it had very limited range, which made it very difficult to use in a naval role, because British ships often did not get close enough to any land-based airfields. There had been plans to have several Stuka squadrons based on the Graf Zeppelin aircraft carrier, but the carrier was never completed, and so the role to be played by the Stuka in the war at sea was quite limited. During the early months of the war, Goering would push his squadrons to be more aggressive in their reconnaissance and air attacks due to the lack of success that they were having, while at the same time, the early U-boat campaigns were having some real successes, especially with an attack by U-47 under its commander Gunther Prien in Scapa Flow, which resulted in the sinking of the British battleship Royal Oak. The Luftwaffe were presented with an even more enticing opportunity to kind of meet Goering's demands when reports were received that the HMS Hood was entering into Rossith on October 16th, which was within range of German bombers. What we know now is that it was not the Hood, but instead the Repulse, and the ship was immediately going into dock, which meant it could not be attacked anyway. This was due to orders that were still in effect for German bombers that they were to very strictly avoid collateral and civilian damage during these early weeks and months of the war when attacking Britain and France. This was just something that they were doing at the time that would change in 1940, but in October 1939, the orders were still in force as a way of trying to give Britain and France an out if they wanted to exit after the defeat of Poland. But what the Luftwaffe believed was that the Hood was heading into Rosseth, and there might be a chance to attack it. So a dozen JU-88s were dispatched to launch the attack. The strike was commanded by Hauptmann Pohl, and they would arrive over the port at 2.30 p.m. They would catch the British air defenses completely by surprise, allowing Pohl and the other pilots to carefully evaluate the situation and pick a target. They could not find Hood, because it wasn't there, but they did see the repulse, but it was in dock and so they couldn't attack it. For lack of other options, they determined that the best option for the attack were two British cruisers, which would be the Southampton and the Edinburgh. Pohl would launch his attack, diving in on the Southampton, and actually managing to put his 1,000-pound bomb on the cruiser, but it failed to explode. Instead, it simply went through three decks and then out the other side of the ship. This would be the only bomb that would hit either of the cruisers, and the fact that it failed to explode was disappointing, but shockingly common during the early years of the war. We're going to be talking a lot about air attacks against ships over the next however many episodes and however many years, and there's a lot of instances (laughs) where either bombs or torpedoes hit ships but do not explode. And that is true for all nations, in all theaters, uh, really up until the last years of the war. Soon after the attacks were launched, Spitfires of 602 Squadron arrived on the scene and drove off the Ju-88s, claiming the destruction of two of them, including that of Pohl, who would survive but be taken prisoner. The general failure of the attack on Rossith was a very disappointing result for the Luftwaffe, with barely any real damage from the raid and the loss of two bombers. Soon afterwards, they would launch another raid, this time against Scapa Flow. Scapa Flow was the British Home Fleet's wartime base, where it had been harbored for the entirety of the First World War, and where it planned to spend the Second World War as well. Before the advent of aircraft, Scapa Flow had been a safe area, with the perfect position to control the entrances of the North Sea, due to its position in the Orkney Islands off the northern coast of Scotland. But now it was found to be very vulnerable to the attacks of German bombers, 
with several Ju-88s launching a raid that would attack the Iron Duke, an old battleship which had been turned into an administrative center after having most of its guns removed. Two bombs would hit the ship, which would be pushed onto shore by a nearby tug, which is all that prevented it from sinking. Even though the attack had not damaged any ship of real value, although one person was killed and 25 were wounded, the attack was a rude awakening for the Royal Navy that Scapa Flow was very vulnerable to air attacks. The anti-air defenses in the area simply were not strong enough, and the air cover was mostly non-existent. This caused the home fleet to be moved out of Scapa Flow and into Loch U on the western shores of Scotland. Loch U was safe from German bombers, but made it more difficult for the Royal Navy to quickly respond to events in the North Sea, simply because they were further away. It was a time and distance problem. The home fleet would remain based at Loch U until March 1940, when Admiral Forbes brought them back to Scapa Flow. But as soon as this return became known to the Germans, they once again prepared to launch an air attack on Scapa Flow. This was particularly important for the Kriegsmarine at that moment because the operations against Norway were planned for April, so it would be very useful if the home fleet was as far away as possible. The first raid would be launched on March 16th, with 16 HE-111s and 18 JU-88s, with the combined 34 aircraft being much larger than the previous Scapa Flow raid. However, the only ship that was hit was the cruiser Norfolk, which was hit by a bomb that penetrated into the bowels of the ship and exploded near the shell room of the Y turret, which resulted in flooding and then purposeful flooding of magazines for safety reasons. Even with this success, no other major attacks were immediately launched against Scapa Flow, and it would not be until April 8th that another raid would be flown. On that day, and then on the two days that followed, raids would be launched in direct support of the invasion of Norway. But in all cases, the home fleet was already at sea, and there was little left to bomb. The final raid would be on April 10th, and it would be met by increased British fighter support, which would result in seven German bombers being shot down. And this put a pause on Scapa Flow attacks, at least for the immediate future, if only because the home fleet was largely at sea for the next several weeks due to the Norwegian campaign. I thank you for listening, and I hope you will join me next episode, in which we will start the discussion about the actions of the German panzer Schiff in the early months of the war including the story of the Admiral Graf Spey, which would be sunk in December 1939. Longtime listeners may remember a Graf Spey, an Admiral Graf Spey, which took part in actions during the First World War, which History of the Great War covered in, starting in episode 48, way back in 2015. If you want to listen to those episodes, you certainly can to prepare for next episode, in which we will talk about the actions of the namesake of Admiral Graf Spey, the Admiral Graf Spey, in 1939.